introduce the, our first presenter of this evening. I hope you all already know him, but if just in case you didn't, um, I'm very privileged and honored to present Ian Haney Lopez, who's one of the nation's leading thinkers on how racism has evolved in the United States since the civil rights era. And if you haven't read it, you can buy it here today and get it signed. He is the author of three books and most recently, Dog Whistle Politics, How Coded Racial Appeals Have Reinvented Racism and Wrecked the Middle Class, a must read. Please give some race forward love to Mr. Ian Haney Lopez. Wow, it's a tremendous honor to be here. So this panel is supposed to be the next 50, and the next 50 is you all, right? The next 50 is you all, and when I look out at this activist crowd, at this multi-hued crowd, I think about the future, it's gonna be all right. It's gonna be all right. But there's two versions of that it's gonna be all right. One version says, in your demographics, in your color, alone, the future's gonna be okay. And another version says, in your racial justice activism, the future's gonna be okay. And now, I think you know which one of those is correct and which one of those is a, a, a deep mistake. But I wanna give you a little bit more context to understand why we can't rely on demographics alone. So in order to do that, I wanna take you back to another moment of profound optimism. 50 years ago, 1964, right about now, Lyndon Johnson had just been elected president. Right? He had signed the Civil Rights Act, the most expansive Civil Rights Act since Reconstruction 100 years before. He had promised a war on poverty. He said, we will end poverty in a generation. We have the power, we have the moral duty to do so. And campaigning on the promise to end poverty he swept the election. He won 44 out of, 40, out of, out of 50 states. Right? It was a landslide, and everybody felt in 1964 that we were on the cusp of a new society, that we would end poverty, that we would end racism. Obviously, that didn't happen. What did happen? Racism evolved. In what way? Well, the Civil Rights Movement, it triumphed in the sense that it drove racism, express racism, open endorsements of white supremacy out of public conversation. You couldn't say spick anymore. You couldn't say nigger. That was a major triumph. But it wasn't a triumph over racism. Instead, racism went underground. It shifted into code. So let me give you a series of terms. States' rights, forced busing, law and order, Silent majority, welfare queen, food stamps, Willie Horton, a tailspin of culture in our inner cities, Muslim terrorists, illegal aliens, Ebola crossing our southern border. These are what I call dog whistles. A dog whistle, it operates on two levels. Human ears, you can't hear it. The, re the register's too high, frequency's too high but it provokes sharp reactions in dogs. And the metaphor here is political speech. Political speech that's operating on two levels. On one level, it's silent about race. Welfare queen, thug, gangbanger. I didn't say race. I just said illegal aliens are flooding our country with illegality. Silent about race. But underneath, it's provoking strong racial reaction. What has happened with racism it is, is it has evolved. It now takes the form of a cultural discourse. We talk about behavior. We talk about, so Paul Ryan, seeking to explain poverty last spring, said it's a tailspin of culture in our inner cities. And as long as he doesn't link it to biology, as long as he doesn't say out and out, black people have dysfunctional culture, it's not racism. Right? Now, these terms that I gave you from states' rights in 1964, to Ebola on our southern border in 2014, those aren't just cultural terms, those are political terms. Because this evolution in racism has been driven by our politicians. They came to understand that the very success of the civil rights movement was creating anxiety among whites. Anxiety that they could exploit, not in the open terms of white supremacy, 
but in the coded terms of dog whistle politics. So for 50 years, since 1964, conservative politicians have been telling whites through subliminal messages, fear minorities. Fear them as criminals, fear them as welfare chiefs. It's no accident that 1964 was the last year a Democratic candidate for president won a majority of the white vote. 50 years ago, that moment of profound optimism, that was the high, because that was the last year a Democratic candidate for president won a majority of the white vote in this country. And I'll tell you what, that's not the worst of it. That's not the worst of it. Conservative politicians have been using race to stampede white voters in a particular direction. They've been telling white voters, you need to fear minorities, but you also need to despise government. Why? Because ostensibly it's government that is coddling minorities by showering welfare and free education on us. And supposedly it's government that refuses to control us, won't put us in jail enough, won't seal the border against our hordes. And so white voters are internalizing this message that says fear minorities, hate government. And conservatives tell them, here's what you can do about this. You can cut taxes because that's going to keep government from wasting your hard-earned money on these undeserving minorities, when in fact what it does is transfer massive amounts of money to the very rich. Then it says to white voters, you should cut social spending, you should cut government spending. Now, among conservatives, government spending never goes down. It goes up, but it goes to the special interests, to the corporations, to the military-industrial complex. What does go down is spending on welfare, spending on education, spending on infrastructure, spending on home loans, spending on job training programs. And the last thing conservatives tell these voters is, since you fear government, you ought to trust the marketplace, which is another way of saying, let the very rich, let concentrated capital rewrite the rules of the marketplace in their favor. Let them rewrite the rules of government in their favor. This is the Koch brothers, right? Where are we now? Today's Republican Party draws 94 to 95% of its support from white voters. It elects 98% of its elected officials are white. This is a party by and for whites, supposedly. But in fact, it's for the very rich because this party has been driving a series of policies that since the 1970s have taken us from a place where the top 1% earned 10% of the income of the country to a place now where the top 1% take home over a quarter of the income of the country. It has taken us to a place where the six heirs to the Walton fortune have as, more, as much wealth as 30% of the rest of, um, of, of Americans, right? That is, that is, this narrative of, of, of race that has, been constant, that has been used to constitute a Republican Party that is essentially a party by and for whites, supposedly, is the same narrative that has driven a set of policies that have wrecked the economy for everybody but the top 1%. That's where we are now. And just to be clear, when Mitt Romney ran in 2012 on these same policies, cut taxes for the very rich, slash social spending, give control over the economy to the very rich, to the corporations, he lost, but not among whites. He won 59% of the white vote. He won among white men. He won among white women. He won among every age cohort of whites, including the young. That's where we are today, which is good news which is good news, right? Because demographically, it's all changing. The Census Bureau tells us that whites will be a numerical majority, mi minority in less than 30 years, 2043, numerical minority. And so this sort of politics can't continue, right? Because it's so dependent on whites. Wrong. Wrong on a couple of different reasons. Wrong because when we say numerical minority, we misunderstand the terms minority and majority. These terms aren't about numbers, they're about power. They're about status, 
They're about access to resources. And whatever else happens by 2043, whites will not be a minority in the sense of being low status, low access to resources, low access to power. That's one. Two, the census gets that number by not counting Latinos. We know already today, more or less half of Latinos think that they're white. They identify as white. And when you include that number, then 30 years from now, the white population will be 72% of the population of the country. It's 63% now. So we may not be in a period in which the white population is shrinking, we may be in a period in which the white population is expanding, depending on what happens with Latinos, depending on what happens with Asian Americans, depending on what happens with African Americans, especially the lighter skin, the more professional. The white population may be expanding. Now, are the architects of dog whistle politics, these sort of race baiters on the conservative side, are they gonna put up with this? I mean, the whole business is about demonizing minorities. Yeah, they're gonna embrace this expansion of whiteness. Because you gotta understand, the people who are driving this in order to take over government, they're not doing so from a sort of a point of view of bigotry, a sort of hate every black person, hate every brown person. They're doing so from the point of view of strategy. It's strategic racism. Strategic racism isn't rooted in hate. It is rooted in a cold-eyed calculation that by manipulating racial anxiety in the public, they can get ahead and get what they want. And for these strategic racists, if the boundaries of whiteness need to expand, let it expand. Okay. Here's what matters. It's not white per se that matters. It's not ancestry, it's not skin color. It's not the boundary of whiteness that matters. Let it include some Latinos, let it include Ted Cruz. Doesn't matter, the boundaries don't matter. What matters is the concept of whiteness itself because the concept of whiteness itself is rooted in the narratives that these politicians have been telling, a narrative that says some people belong and are hardworking and decent and play by the rules and ought to govern. Other people are cheats and schemers and criminals and carry disease and don't belong and ought not to be able to rule this country. Right? It's the narrative of whiteness that's dangerous to us all. So this is the future I see here, the future that you all represent because I see in you people who are actively contesting how racism has evolved over the last 50 years, people who are actively getting ready to contest how racism will continue to evolve, people who understand that the biggest threat in all of our lives is a notion of whiteness that says some people belong and other people are dangerous. Because it's this notion of whiteness that allows the very rich to say, fear the non-whites. Don't worry about us as we take control of government and hijack the economy. So all of us have an obligation to fight whiteness. And again, I want to emphasize, for those of you who are white, this isn't a fight white message. I don't care about your skin color, whether you're from Europe, your ancestry, your accent, your name. I don't care about any of that. It's all great, beautiful. It's the concept of whiteness that it gives one a special privilege, a special status, and that others are a threat to you because they don't share your whiteness. That's what we have to fight. And let me add, as my closing remark, something that you all know, we need to fight the concept of whiteness among non-whites. Because the concept of whiteness that idea that if you take on a white identity, you can proclaim a sense of belonging and status and privilege that requires you at the same time to look down on others and say they're a threat. That's the risk. That's the risk we all fight. So you are all the future in your multi-hued splendor, but more and more because of your racial justice activism committed to fighting whiteness among whites and 
among non-whites. Thank you all. Did y'all just learn something? Let's give Ian Haney Lopez another round. Some food for thought. Now, Ian was only one of our first three presenters, so hang on tight, y'all. We have two more to go. And next up is our longtime friend of Race Forward, Mr. Van Jones. Van. Van is president and co-founder of Rebuild the Dream, a platform for bottom-up, people-powered innovations to help fix the U.S. economy. He's also an attorney. He's founded some other organizations. He's run some other organizations. He also worked as the, G the Green Jobs Advisor. I thought it was Green Jobs Czar, but I guess we can't say Czar anymore. So Green Jobs Advisor to the Obama White House. He's often in the media, and it takes someone with courage to agree and sign up to fight Newt Gingrich every week. So give it up to our longtime friend, leader of our, one of the leaders of our movement, Mr. Van Jones. They got all kind of post-its up here. Have this been busted out? It says, you are not alone. You got this. You're doing great. You're doing great. You're not alone. You got this. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> That's some encouraging stuff. I should put that in front of all my speeches. Um, well, first of all, it's just an honor to be here. Um, I'm supposed to talk about the future. You know, uh, Yogi Berra had probably the most profound insight about, this, about uh, the future, you know, trying to make predictions. Uh, he said, predictions are very hard, especially about the future. So, uh, and, um, and I think he's right. Uh, because there are many futures that are out there, and you get the one you fight for. There are many futures that are out there, and as the brother just said, you get the one you fight for. So I want to talk with you about the futures I think we should be fighting for and why I think we can win. Uh, I happen to work for an organization called Rebuild the Dream. Uh, the campaigns we're working on reflect what we think we should be fighting for. We think we, there's a future out there that sucks. <laughs> and there's one that's out there that's awesome. Uh, the future that sucks has more, more prisons and more of us not only in prison but under constant surveillance people in our community being, hey, they might close the prisons and just put chips in our head. Uh, but there's a future out there where you're, we live in a surveillance security state with very little freedom. There's a future out there where smart screens and robots and apps have wiped out a billion jobs, wiped out a billion jobs. A lot of this stuff, you know, we love downloading all this stuff, but you know, you often are wiping jobs out, luckily, and let's give uh, rock a hand for an app that's actually going to protect jobs. That's the kind of technology we need. Technology's going to help jobs. Uh, there's a future out there where we've cooked the planet, uh, and we aren't here. Uh, in case you weren't paying attention, that's the future that sucks. Okay. <laughs> um, there's another future out there as well, where we've closed prison doors, where we've opened doors of opportunity for our young people into a new and green economy. And that's a future that's awesome. And that's a future that we actually have a chance to create. So I want to talk about why I think we are in position to win that better future. And it starts, of course, with Newt Gingrich. <laughs> what? <laughs> um, I have uh, had the honor in the past year to get a chance to debate with Newt Gingrich on uh, CNN. Uh, for a show that we call The Crossfire. Um, I can assure you, uh, I haven't convinced him of very much. Um, and we don't agree on anything. <laughs> Except prisons. Something has begun to happen that we need to be very aware of, critical of, skeptical of, but open to. 
when you talk to Newt Gingrich about prison, he says that we have gone way too far, that we have a big, unaccountable government bureaucracy that succeeds by failing. Uh, the worse it does, the more money it gets. And he has been opposing, behind the scenes with conservatives, this expansion of prison system for about 10 years. Nobody knows that. Because I got a chance to debate these guys on TV every day, I got a chance to meet conservative after conservative after conservative who didn't agree with me on anything except the prison system's gone too far. The libertarians say they don't want big government. You now have Rand Paul quoting Michelle Alexander on the floor of the U.S. Senate talking about the new Jim Crow. That's just a bad. That's just a it's bad. <laughs> I, but it's not just Newt Gingrich, it's not just Rand Paul. You also have um, the evangelicals who have begun to quote unquote find religion on this. And I've spoken to many of them that say, it's not family values to take a kid who made a mistake, throw him in a situation where he's gonna be brutalized or where she's gonna be brutalized and never give her another chance. So what does that mean? That means that for one moment, you have the bottom up awareness of Ferguson the bottom-up awareness in our community that we cannot continue to have uh, this police lawlessness and this massive incarceration industry coming from our communities. At the same time, if we just look, that there's a top-down motion for all three parts of the Republican Party who, frankly, just don't want to raise taxes to pay for more prisons, if nothing else. So <laughs> there's a future out there. So we launched a campaign called Cut 50 to say, listen, let's fight for the future we want. Let's cut the prison population in half in 10 years. Just cut it in half. Because we, first of all, we still have too many people in prison. But the reality is that if we don't get out there with bold measures and bold solutions, what's going to happen? Well, they'll pass some little bill or some little thing. They'll have the happy little thing. They'll do like they did in Mississippi. Uh, uh, they had a reform to reduce the prison population's growth by 2%. the growth by 2%. And they call that a huge victory and whatever, and that's what we'll get. Or we could get something we really want if we fight for it. And I'm so proud to be working with Shaka Senghor and Jessica Jackson, all these great heroes who had their lives impacted by the prison system who are now standing up. So please give a round of applause to Shaka Senghor, <laughs> Jessica Jackson, all those great heroes who are gonna turn this thing around. So that's one thing. Let's close the prison doors and let's be bold about it. And let's be bold enough to work with people we don't usually work with. But I want to share with you something else. I think we've been tricked. I got a chance to work in the White House. Um, we had 60 votes in the Senate. We had Pelosi running the House. We had Obama at his global height in the White House and we still got beat. Why? I think that we have been playing this game misunderstanding where power actually is. There's not one center of power, Washington, D.C. I think there's at least four. There's Washington, D.C., there's Wall Street, big finance, Silicon Valley technology, Hollywood media. And it's all four systems working together that give us the outcome. So from 63, the March on Washington, begging a president to do the right thing, to 2009, having a black president, almost a 50-year run, we were focused on politics. We were focused on Negro mayors. We were focused on lawsuits. We were focused on getting the presidency. We were focused on politics. And when we got the democracy in our hands, the plutocracy, Wall Street, attacked. The celebtocracy, divide and distract from the media system, attacked. And the technocracy, Silicon Valley, pulled the rug out from under us so that you actually have a jobless recovery. Why? Because the recovery has been great for robots, apps and smart screens, terrible for our communities. And we are not playing this game. 
with a play in Wall Street, Silicon Valley, or Hollywood, yes, we can be on TV, we don't own the station. So I think we've been tricked. And I think if we're gonna be serious about power and serious about the future that we want, we're gonna have to start expanding our hustle. We're gonna have to have a play in finance, a play in technology, and a play in media, and begin to tell our own stories and own this daggum thing. And so, so I wanna tell you about something we're doing called Yes We Code. Uh, not Yes We Can, uh, we, we did that twice. Uh, and thank God we did, uh, but yes, we code. I don't think the future is being written in laws in Washington, D.C. I think the future is being written in code in Silicon Valley, and we're not there. It's being written by a tiny, narrow demographic slice of mostly white men. They have the tools, the training, and the technology to build the future, and they are building it without us. It is a democracy issue when you see the numbers from Google, the numbers from Facebook, the numbers from those com companies, and African Americans, Latinos, most kinds of Asian folks, Native Americans, most women are not there at all. It's a democracy issue because they will, the, the, the products they build, ship, and sell will have more of an impact on your daily life tomorrow than any of this food fight nonsense in Washington, D.C. And we have to have a strategy to get in there. So people have a myth about our kids, that our kids don't want to be a part of technology and that they can't do it. Well, we launched a campaign called Yes, We Code to identify 100,000 low opportunity, high potential, mostly African American, Native American, Latino girls and boys who do want to be involved. Right now in Philadelphia, there is a hackathon happening. Uh, the White House is there. It's a Yes We Code hackathon. And the White House is there. MSNBC is there broadcasting it live. Google is there. And amazing kids from our communities are there. And you know what they're doing? They're building apps. Now, this is an important thing. I get a chance to talk to our kids all over the country, and so do you. Don't put up with this crap from our kids. I ask them, how many of you guys have smartphones? They all say, eh, I do. I say, good, good for you. I say, I'm an old dude. I don't know anything about this. How many of you guys have ever downloaded an app? Oh, I have, I have. I say, okay. Third question. How many of you have ever uploaded one? How many of you have ever uploaded an app and no hand goes up? And I say, you know why? Because you're suckers. We're suckers. When you download somebody else's app and you use it, you make money for somebody you don't even know. The way you make money in this game is you upload your own app and have somebody else use it. Now, look at how they have us here moving our thumbs around, thinking we're cool, making somebody else money. Moving our thumbs around, thinking we're cool, making somebody else money. You know what we used to call that? Picking cotton. We used to call that picking cotton. We used to call that picking fruit in the field. Nothing wrong with it. Nothing wrong with it. But we deserve to be more, and we deserve to fight for more, and we deserve to insist on being more than just digital cotton pickers in the information economy. We need to be uploaders and not downloaders. <laughs> uploaders and not downloaders, our next generation. We insist on that as a right, as a right to participate as owners, as builders, as creators. And our young people, by the way, if we get this part of it right, don't sleep. This whole new digital economy that's being built globally a digital economy being built globally with people in every country with these things in their hands. What's it based on? Creativity? All our kids creative. Connectivity? Our kids over-index on social media. Communications? We make up words and I was on the air and Wolf Blitzer was like, I want to give a shout out to, I was like, what? You give us shout outs? <laughs> Wolf! <laughs> we
We drive culture, creativity, communication. That's us. That's our children. We just don't code. So then we're communicating on a platform we don't own. So we're having a hackathon right now and young people are building their own apps. They're building apps to help them navigate the criminal justice system because Silicon Valley won't do it for them. Building apps to help them navigate the foster care system because Silicon Valley won't do it for them. Now you imagine if you have 100,000 or more of our kids with the tools, training, technology to build a future that works for them. That has to be a part of the future that we're fighting for and the future that we want. Now, luckily, by the way, Yes We Code is just the, the clearinghouse for so many organizations I can't even name, whether it's Black Girls Code, Hack the Hood, Hidden Genius Project, Smash Academy, Latino Tech Alliance. I mean, there's so many of these organizations, but we're proud to be able to help them uh, so we can stop wasting genius. And the last thing I want to talk about is so what? So what? Close the prison doors, great. Let everybody get a tech job, great. What are we doing? Is it enough? And this is, this is a real question. Is it enough for us just to stop some of the worst stuff from happening in our community and then integrate ourselves into whatever next iteration of the same system comes along? now technologi technologically enabled and digital, but the same old thing. Is that enough? Or should we close prison doors, open doors of opportunity into a new green economy? That's the question. Because if we're gonna be the majority, and if we're gonna start being as sophisticated as the system we're trying to change, just like Brother Ian said, they don't mind working across different lines if it's to their interest. We should be willing to work with Republicans to close prison doors. I think the brothers and sisters in jail would be very happy if Newt came and said, come on out. So, like, we need to be, you know, smart enough to work toward our own interests, fight against anybody, work with anybody for our own interests. But what are our interests? At a certain point, and we have to be as wise as our ancestors who were never confused about this question of the earth and whether it belongs to us or we belong to it. I'm tired of people telling me that an environmental awareness is something that white folk have. I see no evidence that white folk and Europeans love the earth and we don't. I just don't see the evidence. And so at a certain point, we have to stand up and own the narrative about what this, what, of what, what this economy is going to be. And we have to have the ability to shape it. In closing, let me say something that may surprise some people. But I do hope in the next 50 years, this thing that we call America, the best parts of it, still around. I say that not because I'm somebody running for office or politician or any of that type of stuff. I say it because having worked in the White House, held the country in my arms for six months, see how fragile it all is. And I had to really ask myself some tough questions about this country and, and how I feel about it. And I came to a conclusion I want to share, which is this. America's worth fighting for, America's worth saving, even in this globalized economy and the nation states going away and all this type of stuff. Because America's two things and not one. America has an ugly founding reality. Slavery, genocide, women can't vote, lesbians and gays don't even have a name. A ugly, horrific, horrible founding reality. Nobody who denies that should even be taken seriously in conversation. In fact, in fact, if you go to Washington, D.C. and go to the Jefferson Memorial, Jefferson himself, in marble, at his own memorial, says, I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just. 
Jefferson. I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just. What's he talking about? He's talking about slavery. He's talking about the genocide. He's talking about all the things that the founders failed to do. That's not radical Van Jones. That's Thomas Jefferson talking about the founding nightmare that we started out with. But that's not all America is. That same slaveholding Thomas Jefferson also somehow wrote down something he said, I hold these truths to be self-evident, that all are created equal. And that's the founding dream. Ugly, horrible founding reality. Beautiful, unbelievable founding dream. Who are we? Who are the best folk in America? We are the people who get up every dad gum day and try to take one more step to close the gap between that founding reality and that founding dream. That's who we are. That's who we've been for 200, 300 years. The best of America. Don't you tell me, Fox News, you're the patriots. Don't you tell me that. Don't you tell me that. Because if you're a patriot, you believe in liberty and justice for all. Not liberty and justice for all except for the gay folk. Not liberty and justice for all except for poor folk or labor organizers. You believe in liberty and justice for all. If you're a deep patriot, not a cheap patriot, but a deep patriot, you believe in America the beautiful. That's the environmentalist. If you're a deep patriot, you read the Statue of Liberty, it says, give me your tired, give me your poor, give me your huddled masses who yearn to breathe free. You can't be a anti-immigrant bigot and a patriot at the same time. The Statue of Liberty won't let you do that. The Statue of Liberty won't let you do that. So, so as strange as it sounds, and after all we've been through, all of us, on these shores, The future worth fighting for is one in which we've closed prison doors, we've opened doors of opportunity into a new green economy worthy of the wisdom of our great-grandparents, and in a country that has liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. I've been watching everybody's thumbs on those phones since y'all got to the conference, and now I'm starting to think about a lot of things right now. We're almost to the end. Um, I wanted to share a quote um, with people, um, and this is a quote that I bring with me to every space that I'm in, and I also share it with people who come to the space that I'm in, and I think it's very relevant to this convening this weekend, but also in introducing our last but definitely not least presenter. If you have come here to help me, you are wasting our time. But if you have come because your liberation is bound up with mine, then let us work together. Keep that with you when you leave here today. Last but definitely not least is the reason why many of us are here um, at this convening, someone who is a visionary a leader in the racial justice movement, someone who many of us consider a mentor, a sister, and someone who pushes us to have these hard conversations and to see ourselves in others. It is with great privilege and honor to introduce to you someone who's not a stranger to and shouldn't be to anyone in this room, the executive director and president of Race Forward and the publisher of Color Lines, our sister, our visionary, our rock star, Rinku Sen. Aww. 
Y'all not tired of me yet? <laughs> Look, Dallas, I wore my cowboy boots for you. <laughs> Thank you, Ian and Van, for being with us. When I was a young organizer, decades and decades ago, the first campaign I ran on my own was organizing about 50 homeless families, most of them black, to shut down a notorious welfare hotel in which they were living as temporary housing. It was a single room occupancy hotel that crammed families of three to six people into one room or sometimes two, with no kitchens, not even a refrigerator. People used to hang their groceries out the window in bags, broken toilets and mice and roaches wandering everywhere. So one day, while we were in the middle of the campaign, one of the members and I, he was a young man named Aaron, we were scoping out our target's neighborhood. We were gonna do a rat relocation program, you know, rats from the <laughs> slum to the neighborhood for an action. Anyway, we were, we were um, scoping out the neighborhood. And we spent a bunch of time just sitting in the car looking at the neighborhood and, and waiting and watching and talking. So at one point, Aaron turned to me. He was, I think, 19 at the time, and I wasn't much older, maybe 21. He turned to me and he asked me, what are you doing here with us? You're supposed to be with them. And what he meant by them was the Indian immigrant family that owned the slum, that had been making buckets of money, essentially warehousing homeless, mostly black families for hundreds of dollars a room every month. At the time that he asked me this, I couldn't really think of what to say. I hadn't really thought everything through. I was just, I had discovered organizing maybe four years before that and I was just doing it. So I came up with some platitude about how I hated injustice and so I wanted to be an organizer. I decided to become an organizer. But I still think about that conversation today. It's been a pretty solid 25 years since it happened. I think about it all the time. Because behind Aaron's question was something that wasn't just about me and him. I came from the oppressor class and he came from the oppressed class. What did our communities have to do with each other? In the next 50 years, in the next story of us, that question has to get answered. As our country's gem demographics change we and we become a minor, uh, blah, majority people of color nation, there are two different versions of what the future could look like. One vision is apocalyptic, where we compete brutally for scarce resources, where we kill each other, literally, to preserve the little that we have. The other vision is lovely, it's beautiful. Discrimination will disappear. We will work together to solve our social problems and we'll create a situation in which all of us can thrive. Again and again, I hear from people that this will just happen. It will just happen as we interact across race, as we date and marry each other, as we produce offspring who all have quote unquote exotic looking eyes and hair and off-white skin. Y'all remember that National Geographic story, right? What the, future of, um, what the future American will look like. So as physical difference disappears, the idea is, so will discrimination. But as many people, probably some in this room from multiracial families can tell you, having a variety of relatives doesn't magically disappear the notion that whiter is better. We cannot just date our way to pluralistic harmony. <laughs> you can trust me on this, because I've tried. <laughs> and yet, this vision is within our reach, but it's only possible with super strong ties and relationships, bonds between our communities and our organizations, not just between individuals. I know that in the course of this conference, you have come across many people, and you are the people, who are creating really great local alliances, who are able to beat local institutions into doing the right thing, into treating people properly. And you are changing those institutions that change our lives. But if we're really honest, we will admit that this is not the story that we know best. 
We know much, much better the stories of groups competing with each other, often for the bottom position in the hierarchy, because that's where we think, where we have experienced resources and sympathy uh, being generated from. I remember this one time soon after the tsunami in Asia, there was a New York radio DJ who made a bunch of anti-Asian jokes based on the tsunami, using the tragedy of the tsunami to make anti-Asian jokes. And all kinds of Asian people called into the radio station and wrote blogs and tweeted, <laughs> tweeted, and they said, if this had happened to any other group, it would never be tolerated. But of course, horrible things are said on the radio about other groups and elsewhere all the time, and they are not just tolerated, but encouraged, quite well encouraged indeed. So there's that competition story. But even that is not the story we really hear the most. What we hear the most in the current story is a profound silence about one another. A silence so profound that when one person says something in solidarity with a group that is considered unusual for them, all of us in the racial justice movement fall all over ourselves with gratitude. These statements, such as a South Asian statement, maybe in support of the warriors in Ferguson, or statements of black people grieving over a, a massacre at a Gurdwara at a Sikh temple in Oak Creek, Wisconsin. Such statements are so rare that they really stand out. They're extremely noticeable when they happen. If we care about the terrible things that happen to people who are not us, we are not saying so. To date, we have been seeing ourselves as separate constituencies that occasionally act in alliance with each other. In the next story of us, we have to see ourselves as one constituency, a constituency that wants racial justice. That new majority isn't going to just be it has to be organized. I have said before that we can commit to taking apart the racial hierarchy even though we occupy different positions within it. Every time I say that, all the people around me nod their heads in agreement. So they clearly agree. And yet, no one has asked me what I actually mean by that. No one has asked me, so I decided to ask myself. No one challenged me, so I decided to challenge myself. I decided. I may get it wrong, but the stakes are too high right now for me to just put out vague platitudes that don't have any substance. So, to build the 21st century multiracial unity and power that we need, we have to understand the role of the black-white paradigm and of anti-blackness in a changing America. The history of slavery, the centuries-long control of formerly enslaved communities, the American attachment to black stereotypes, these things shape our reality so deeply that they affect all of us. Asians, Arabs, Latinos, Native people, all the varieties of white people, and I know you have some variety, we all have to fit ourselves into this paradigm in order to survive. Will we identify up to white? or will we identify down to black? That is the question. The last time there was such a massive demographic change in population growth in our country was after the Civil War, emancipation and reconstruction. Starting in about 1870, when waves of European immigrants were allowed to immigrate, in large part to provide a cheaper alternative to hiring free black people. German, Italian, Irish immigrants weren't even considered white, but they became so in the context of a black and white paradigm. We think that option won't be available to today's Asian and Latino immigrants, but it could with the concept of honorary whiteness. That black-white paradigm is central to racial hierarchy, not because blacks are always at the bottom of that ladder, not because they are always going to be the most hated, in a particular place and time, that dubious honor might come to an undocumented Latino immigrant 
or it might come to a native tribe member, or it might come to an Arab, a South Asian, a Muslim who is feared to be a terrorist. But anti-blackness sets the national discourse on race, so fighting it has to be on the agenda of every single person and group who claims to be about racial justice. And yet, fighting anti-blackness cannot be the only thing on our political and cultural agenda. The black-white paradigm does have some inadequacies. It has some limitations. It is not that great, for example, in working out how to think about indigenous communities and how to deal with the needs of the foreigner. For our Native American brothers and sisters, it must be particularly difficult, emotionally and intellectually speaking, to have slavery acknowledged as the fundamental building block of modern US society when we are all only here because there was a genocide. <laughs> Even the descendants of enslaved Africans are here only because there was a genocide. Yet the word genocide is rarely used outside of political circles of highly conscious people of color. It's worth noting that European colonialists wiped out, through a variety of means, 90% of the indigenous population. If you look at this room, that would mean that only the people in just that little corner over there would be left. All the rest of us would be gone. It may be the greatest of ironies that because of that genocide, we have a black-white paradigm. I've seen how different the race discussion is in Canada, where their primary race paradigm is white and indigenous. It's about colonialism rather than slavery. That's what the major story is there. But we don't live in Canada, most of us, even though we threaten to go after every galling election. <laughs> The resilience of Native communities, their hundreds of years of rebuilding, their struggle to get the federal government to live up to treaties and to recognize tribes for what is known as sovereignty, that is nothing short of amazing. It deserves our attention, our admiration, and our help. The black-white paradigm can also exclude the needs of the foreigner, even of the black foreigner. The changing demographics we see now are about Asian and Latino immigrants who are excluded to coming throughout that post-reconstruction immigration wave and who began to arrive in large numbers after the passage of the Immigration and Nationality Act of 1965. I owe my own presence on this stage to that law, which was unquestionably a byproduct of the civil rights movement. Perhaps an unintended byproduct, but one nonetheless that owes itself to that movement. Yet many Indian immigrants and their offspring are all too eager to distance themselves from black communities and from that civil rights movement. Fully accepting a role, our role, a role that has been assigned to us as the quote unquote solution to the problem of black insurgents as the historian Vijay Prashad lays out so beautifully in his book, The Karma of Brown Folk. It feels like every time I go on a call-in radio show, there's some white guy who calls in and uh, accuses me of playing the race card. That white guy often calls in with a story about his Indian friend, his Indian best friend, who arrived in the country with 10 cents in his pocket and who has never experienced one moment of discrimination. Whether consciously and, or not, if indeed Indians are telling, telling this white guy that story, we are fitting ourselves into the black-white paradigm somewhere near the top, and every time a racism denier quotes one of those stories, he is reinforcing the racial hierarchy itself. The racial profiling of South Asians, Arabs, Muslims following September 11th woke a lot of us up, shocked us into a new awareness, but it is still possible for people who look like me to resist the profiling of ourselves in airports, but fully support the profiling of other people on the streets of New York City, for example. 
And because the black-white paradigm doesn't deal so well with the fear of foreigners, it is also possible for black and Latino Americans to feed that fear, uh, to feed that fear of South Asians as potential terrorists. I meet lots and lots of immigrants and refugees, not the ones in this room, of course, but plenty nonetheless, who don't think that their struggle is racial. Even among African American Caribbean, African and Caribbean immigrants, this can be true. But all of the burden for understanding that our fight is a racial fight, that where we fit is, a, is within a racial hierarchy, that burden cannot be on the individual immigrant only. That person needs to be recruited, educated, included, considered, campaigned for, not just in the immigrant rights movement, but also in the racial justice movement. They shouldn't have to leave behind their immigrant experience and their immigrant identities in order to get here, just as Native people shouldn't have to leave behind their sovereignty frame in order to get here. If we are to build the kind of cross-racial unity and power we dream of, we all have to plant a stake. To plant a stake, you have to have a stake in the first place. Building an agenda together from the beginning that is grounded in fighting anti-blackness, but also in protecting other people of color from the terrible things that are happening to them, that is our critical first step. And then there are three things we can do that will help us move forward. The first is to understand that our identities are complicated. The second is to recognize that who we are is constantly changing. The third is to make friends with people who are not like us. We need to remember that our identities are complex and that race is only one part of us. We need to understand how class, gender, sexuality, and nationality play out in our identities as well, because the very poor are our people. Women are our people. Queer people are our people. People with disabilities, they are our people. Really integrating this into our thinking will lead to different kinds of fights and strategies. Dealing with how patriarchy, sexual control, rampant capitalism interact with racial oppression might bring us into greater partnership with white folks. We spend a lot of ink and time berating poor and working class white communities for separating themselves from people of color, even as we do a terrible job of recruiting them to the fight for racial justice. There is, there is an alliance begging to be built between the race-based police reform movement and the disability rights movement. People with mental illness are shot and killed by the police at alarming rates. Folks call the police for help when their loved ones are having breakdowns only to wind up with their kids, their siblings, their parents dead, dead at the hands of a police officer. To be sure, a lot of those folks are also people of color, but poor white people with these issues are vulnerable and dying, and we ought to be able to get them on our side. Second, our identities change over time. It is our birthright as human beings to come into ourselves, to change our minds about who we are, and to live into that new identity. I loved it yesterday when Kay, Key Jackson talked about the intense pressure that she feels that we all experience to pick a sexuality, post it on Facebook, and make sure that it never, ever changes. It might change tomorrow, she said, and that's a beautiful thing. It is a beautiful thing, and that has to be true of our racial identities as well. If we get too attached to who we think we are right now, any shift freaks us out, and building a racial justice communi community and constituency as one, it is going to cause some shifts. Right now, we use people of color to describe ourselves in the collective, but something better might come along, something even more inclusive but still racial, something that my Arab and Persian friends can find uh, a way to relate to and to fit themselves into, along with all that variety of white people. All the variety of white people who I see as white, but who don't see themselves as white, who don't feel white, and who are looking for an alternative identity. We have to be able to release the urge to claim that unchanging identity, even while taking pride in our specific histories, cultures, and traditions. Finally, we need to make friends. This sounds like a shallow approach to um, building a movement. 
maybe even a little bit corrupt and unsystemic. We laughingly dismiss the person who says, some of my best friends are black or some of my best friends are Indian because we suspect, often correctly, that they're pulling that up to excuse their own bad racial behavior, whatever that might be. But some of my best friends are black and some of them are Asian, some of them are Latinos, some of them are white, some of them are native. Those best friends of mine, they recruit me to support their communities. They inform me about what is going on. They make me show up for their events and they ask me for advice on their campaigns. My best friends regularly tell me about myself and what I did wrong. They never berate me, we just talk because, you know, we're friends and sometimes friends have conflicts. I'll probably hear from a few of them after this talk. <laughs> when we see national leaders stand up for communities other than their own, it is often because their friends recruited them to do that. We made many of those relationships because we have the resources to meet and get to know each other over a period of time so that some trust can develop. But right now, that trust doesn't seep very deeply down into our communities. And so we get leaders such as we are speaking out, often against the sentiments of the base, of the people that we represent. We have to create local efforts in which people of different identities can be with each other, both politically and socially. That trust enables us to have the hardest conversations. These conversations are critical because they keep us from mushing everything together in a way that isn't actionable. And because we do constantly have to make decisions about how to spend our resources. They are not scarce, our resources, they are abundant, but we still have to make decisions about them. And we have to make those decisions together. These decisions are only really possible if we know each other well enough to trust that even raising a particular question isn't going to put us on somebody's shit list forever. And even if we aren't friends, we have to work things out with a lot more compassion and kindness than we currently show to each other when we mess up. And we need to do this in person and usually in private, not on Facebook and not on Twitter. I love Twitter as a medium for many things, but not for resolving and not even for laying out significant political conflicts. Doing these things, grappling with the black-white paradigm, recognizing that identities are complex and shifting, making relationships with each other, they will enable us to write the next story of us as a story of multiracial unity. We can figure out how to drive humanity in, in an equitable direction, but we can only do that together, acting as one movement rather than as a collection of movements working in solidarity is the key. More than anything else, getting to this kind of unity will require our emotional discipline. It's just as important as our intellectual and our physical discipline. The most important aspect of that discipline is to stay in the present, in the right now. Life is only available to us in the present. We cannot do anything about the past and we only shape the future through current action, not by thinking about it. If I was sitting in a car today with Aaron, you remember Aaron, right? This is what I would say when he asked me what I was doing with him. I would say, in the next century, we're gonna have a chance to build multiracial power and to exercise it against greed and discrimination. I'm here because I wanna do that and I want you to do it too. If Aaron then looked at me with any kind of cynicism or doubt, because maybe nothing in his prior experience had given him the sense that such a thing would be likely, I'd reply to him with the words of Thich Nhat Hanh, words I've been reading a lot lately because I fear he won't be with us on this earth too much longer. Because we are alive, everything is possible. Thank you.
Can we have a round of applause for the next 50 plenary with Ian Haney Lopez, Van Jones, and Ranku Sen? Give it up, people. Give it up.